It's my pleasure to uh, introduce Wayne for his third talk. And so therefore, I first got to know Wayne when in, I went to visit in Stuttgart in between 92 and 2002 for a month a year, twice a year, two weeks at a time. And there I just ran into all of these people, most of them microscopists. And so Wayne was, you were only a postdoc there for 11 months and you were there beforehand and afterhand. So to my experience, it said he was just always in Stuttgart, <laughs> right? And apparently did a few things other places too along the way. And, but it was sort of one of those experiences which I thought was really illustrative in science because uh, I'm not an um, electron microscopist, I'm a general spectroscopist, and luckily I was able to work with the people at Sukkart and analyze spectra. I'm also not a high resolution TEM type person, the image processing, but more of the valence eels type things. And so we never actually published a paper together or anything like that. And yet we've been working on the same science topics of wetting and interfaces and what goes on it over all of these years. And it's sort of like, oh, another cool Wayne paper. Oh, I see, I learned something from that. And that's the best part of all, I think, in all of this science is sort of going, ah, I see the things that we learn from our colleagues and it helps keep everything moving together. I thought that was really nice, and I've liked the talk so far. And today we have a third installment. Yes. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, thank you. Stuttgart was really a center, a fulcrum for, for me, and uh, vice versa with everything that Roger said about me, about him. I learned a lot from him over the years, and obviously yesterday had a lot to do with uh, Roger's work. Um, before I begin, a two things. This has got to come off. It's too warm in here. And I want to thank all of you uh, for an amazing week. It's been really fantastic. Uh, I've learned a lot. And you certainly kept me busy. Um, and I've enjoyed all of it. And I want to thank you all. It's been great. Really, really good. Um, the first lecture was a, for the students. And a little bit, or my interpretation of, of Khan's wedding transition. Uh, yesterday, we talked about Bob. Uh, com uh, complexions. Um, uh, Arthur missed it, but uh, it was to, the idea was to prove that, that Bob is real uh, thermodynamically. Um, today, today it's a, a, about grain boundary motion. So I'm not high resolution today at all. Um, I revisited this issue on Illumina, and I'll show you a weird result which I don't understand uh, uh, for silicon carbide in the end. Um, and we set up these model experiments to try to elucidate a phenomena which I still don't really understand. And I think there's going to be a lot to do in the future. So this is more of a lead-in to what we're going to be doing. So I'm going to talk about grain boundary mobility. Um, the driving force we all understand. I'll explain what we don't understand about the mechanisms. Um, and of course, based on the complexion issue that I talked about yesterday, I'll try to relate that in to this phenomena. Uh, with specific dopants. And what I'm going to basically say is that there are some dopants below the solubility limit with, before precipitation happens that slow down grain growth. Well, that's all you drag and everyone's going to say, we know that already. And there are other dopants that below the solubility limit will go to the grain boundary and form and adsorbate, and they will speed up grain growth. And that's weird. Um, and I didn't like that. And so I did these experiments, or we did these experiments, in a methodical way to ensure where we were in the phase diagram so that we could separate it out. So it's a lot of oversimplistic model experiments, but I think there is something that we can, we can say about it. And then towards the end, I'll, I'll give some examples of the influence of external fields, uh, showing that uh, it's also there as well. So grain boundary mobility, or grain boundary motion. Uh, we all know the thermodynamic driving force for a Grain growth, actually I showed that uh, two days ago. Um, and that should be pretty clear. Um, we're eradicating grain boundary area and therefore reducing a total surface or grain boundary energy. The mechanism by which a grain boundary moves is not clear. A Gleiter a, was, if I'm not mistaken, the first to propose a mechanism. And he actually showed some conventional TM results indicating that steps, disconnections, were at the grain boundaries. And he thought that they were the mechanism. And in a different talk in the future, when we finish the next PhD, 
I'll show you the steps in strontium titanate and how they facilitate grain boundary motion. But for right now, it's still uh, an argument what is the exact mechanism and how complexions interact with them. Just to remind everybody, uh, we can measure grain growth, and we know that it'll get larger if we anneal. The grains will get larger if we anneal things, but that's not a very quantitative uh, approach. Uh, what we need to do is to look at the driving force, or look at the velocity of grain boundary motion and normalize it by the driving force, kind of like how we take a force. We normalize it by the area and define a stress. So uh, that's uh, the mobility, where we're taking the velocity uh, divided by the uh, driving force for grain boundary motion. And in the simplistic case, the driving force is the eradication of grain boundary area. So uh, in this approach, which is just a parabolic uh, model, and there are others which can be applied, um, the difference in grain size as a function of time will show us uh, the mobility. The actual mobility is actually here, that's m, and it's multiplied in addition to by the grain boundary energy. And since I don't want to guess about grain boundary energy ever, I'd rather measure it, and since I explained that that's a problem to measure, uh, we're going to leave these together and we'll just call it effective grain boundary mobility. So I'm measuring the grain boundary mobility for this mean uh, ensemble of grain boundaries in the system, and I'm ignoring any changes in the grain boundaries as a function of time. All right, so alumina, which is my first love, uh, we all know that, uh, everybody knows that uh, certain dopants and impurities are important in alumina. Uh, we add magnesia to alumina in order to reach full density, uh, remove pores or prevent them from becoming occluded by growing grains, detaching from the grain boundaries. They stay at the grain boundaries and vacancy diffusion is easier to eradicate them. But it also reduces grain growth. Actually, when I was a PhD student, somebody said that to me, and I, because I had always heard it was important for sintering, and Arthur said, no, it's also important for grain growth. Don't you know that? And I remember that to this day. Did I shout at you? No, that wasn't okay. shouting. Okay. That, that was just you. <laughs> um, and, uh, and of course, Arthur was right. And this is the influence, uh, some measurements from the literature. on This is a, to the power of three, but it doesn't matter, showing the influence of magnesium doping on the grain size. So we all know that it, it's there. But of course, the argument is, well, it's not really the magnesia at the grain boundaries. It's precip precipitates of spinel, which are dragging the grain boundaries. And it's a problem, because we don't really know if there is precipitation there or not, because it's just at the borderline of the solubility limit. Oh, wait a minute. Actually, we don't know the solubility limit, or we didn't. And that was one of the problems. The same can be said for those nasty impurities, and two of them I'm showing here, calcium and silicon, that cause exaggerated and abnormal grain growth. And once again, we add this stuff, but do we, we don't often measure how much we actually have in there when we do the measurement. The example is magnesia, which has a high vapor pressure. So we can add 300 ppm, but I promise you, that's not what you've got in there. So it's really important to monitor this, and at the same time, it's very difficult. Just to reinforce the driving force, so this is from Mehmet, Mehmet Gulgan was, I just think, way over the solubility limit in these samples. But it doesn't matter because the phenomena is still there. You get these elongated uh, grains of alumina, uh, which uh, these big uh, platelets are parallel to the basal plane uh, of alumina. But you can see this also for smaller grain sizes. Um, silicon tends to make it uh, equiaxed and abnormally large. So, Based on what I explained yesterday, uh, if we're below the, even if we're above the solubility limit, if the dopants or impurities will go to the grain boundaries in order to reduce the grain boundary energy, then they'll go there. We have the driving force for them to go. Then the question is, how do they influence the rate of mo the mobility of these same grain boundaries? But in order to do that, we, we need to clarify if we have precipitates. By the way, we also have to clarify if we have pores, uh, prevent pores from being influential. And in order to do that, we have to stop and first take a shot at measuring the grain boundary, uh, the solubility of these materials. And that's what we did. Actually, we started the first material with Amir and Lior. He was his uh, master's. Amir was uh, still in the group at the time. And we started with magnesia uh, in order to develop the technique. And we chose magnesia because that had, we had, there was the most data in the literature for alumina. The, the problem is, how do you measure something that is present in a low amount, but may have a significant amount at the grain boundaries. We want to know the solubility limit. That's how much is in the grains, not at the surfaces. Uh, 
Uh, I remind everyone that the solubility limit does not depend on grain size uh, at all. Um, and uh, the, the, a technique to separate them is extremely problematic. Um, as I'll show you, uh, the method we chose solves this by doing a lot of statistics. Uh, the tr the, there's two tricks. One is preparing the specimen. For that, it's actually easy. We just dope the material so that we're in the two-phase region. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm not showing the magnesium. I'm showing the example with calcia. And uh, by putting ourselves more or less here, we have a, a two-phase mixture of alumina and calcia hexaluminate. Under the condition that we anneal this for a long time and we've reached a homogeneous distribution, we're at equilibrium, then the alumina must be saturated with calcium. And the rest of the calcium is in the calcia hexaluminate. That's undergraduate level phase diagrams. Uh, then we do something we don't allow the students to do. And we open the furnace at 1,600 degrees, take the sample out, and drop it into water. Uh, actually, my students are always there. They have fire extinguishers aimed at me when I do this. And that's really not a bad idea. Um, and then we do a, a, a WDS. The idea with WDS is because of uh, the counting statistics, we can get to detection limits, uh, which are obviously significantly better than EDS. They're not quite as good as SIMS, but of course the errors in SIMS are horrific, and standardization in, in SIMS is problematic. So here we, do, we have to do fully standardized analysis. The question is, how do we measure just what's happening in the grains and not at the grain boundaries? Um, I remind you all, we obviously can't do a thermal etch because that might alter the chemistry of the surface. Um, and without that, we don't even know where the grain boundaries are. So we're going in blind. And the, the approach is quite simple, really. Um, if, and this is my electron beam, and it's interacting. This is our interaction volume. And this is the alumina grain. And if we measure it, and it's just in the alumina grain, then obviously we're going to get a, a number which fits the solubility limit for the specimens I just described. If this interaction volume overlaps with the grain boundary, where there might be an excess, then that it's going to go up. Or if it overlaps with a precipitate, then it's going to really crank out. And we're going to get numbers which are really, really high. So if we just go in and do literally hundreds and hundreds of measurements, we'll get a histogram. And we should be able to see the distribution immediately. That was the idea. Of course, there's other things about quantification which have to be done. And of course, we need to know the detection limit. And there's no point in ever doing an EDS, EELS, WDS, SIMS measurement without knowing what the detection limits are for that specific experiment. But they come right out of the measurements. So here's the example for calcium uh, uh, quenched in water. Uh, this is the general measurement, the frequency of measurements and concentration. Uh, if we zoom in in the, this area, where you have this massive peak and expand the histogram, you see this nice peak, and that's the solubility limit. And this is already information that's coming from the grain boundaries. So that's actually a measure of excess. Not an exact measure, because we don't know the exact overlap of the grain boundaries. But we don't care about that, because we can do that by TM in a better way. This is the solubility limit, and it works out to be 51 ppm at 1,600 degrees C. Uh, with a detection, with a detect. Why is the solubility limit the mean of this distribution and not the minimum? Ah, the minimum actually will go down to zero. So uh, I mean, it would be much lower. I'm, I'm assuming. Uh, How do you explain measuring these minimum values? Yeah. So there's always going to be a distribution of of these of these measurements. Even if it was a single crystal and you go through and measure, statistically, you'll, you'll get some type of a Gaussian, well, hopefully Gaussian distribution. So that's what you're seeing here. This is the good case, Frank. The it, grain boundary peak looks sharper. The, the distribution looks sharper than that. There's less, the because there's less statistics, actually, there. It just peaks up. That's all. It's worse when you look at a sample that you didn't uh, anneal for three days. But you did a grain growth experiment, and then you can immediately see distributions which are inhomogeneous. You'll see that in a minute. Um, a, this, is, by the way, is 421 measurements, this data set. A, the detection limit here is 1 ppm. So we don't have a problem with detection limits. Okay? If we, a, do I have this? Yes, this is furnace cooled. This is when we cool it in the furnace, and we get a 26 ppm. So that's not the the solubility limit at room temperature. It's a solubility limit at some temperature when diffusion becomes no longer important. And uh, 
We don't know what that is, but that's the problem uh, of trying to do this uh, after cooling from, from the, at the rate of the furnace. I just comment that uh, so few proper experiments have been done on quench samples. I've been complaining about this for decades. Yeah, well, it's hot. It's even hotter than this. Um, a, literally, your clothes will light up. Um, but it's worth doing it. And uh, we've now done it for magnesium, which, we, which is what we started with. And that was 132 ppm. That's not 300 ppm that Cobalt talked about. Calcium I gave to you. And the last data point which we measured was silicon, which is 188 ppm. And of course, this point in the middle is for Carol Handeworker, because one of the claims is that uh, this co-doping is what prevents certain dopants from going to grain boundaries and causing exaggerated grain growth. And we're now trying to measure this. And um, hopefully, we'll have something to report about it soon. So we had the technique, and we did these measurements uh, in order to provide this information. And then we prepared these specimens where we either did not dope, and we'll call those undoped. And we doped with uh, magnesium, and we doped with calcium. We're going to ignore silicon because it's extremely problematic. We used the same uh, technique and pressure filtration uh, to make laboratory uh, controlled samples. Um, we also did diffusion bonding experiments where in a very simple way uh, we put it, made a sandwich of uh, sapphire with our polycrystal alumina and that way we could look at the growth rate of the basal plane uh, uh, into these undoped or undoped materials. And just to uh, whip through all the samples that we made in this data set, this is the undoped and the temperatures that we looked at. We did look at different temperatures here. With the calcium and the magnesium doped, everything is only 1,600 degrees C. So we'll start with the undoped material. Uh, this is, Frank, our calcium uh, concentration and magnesium concentration in the undoped materials. Okay? Um, the mean is 5 ppm of calcium, which is actually right in spec with the supplier who did ICP of the powders that they gave us. So we didn't make it any dirtier, but this is as clean as the powders that we were able to get commercially. Magnesium was below our detection limit of 2 ppm. Okay? We sintered this to 98.7% uh, 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 density, and then we did a series of uh, growth experiments where we measured the grain size as a function of time and temperature. What I'm showing you here is our data at different temperatures already translated to mobility. I'm skipping through all the details, and I'm comparing it to the data that's in the literature, including the Harmer data, which Shen Dillon was kind enough to give us his raw data because we had to recalculate this and to do it actually in a parabolic fashion. And it fits out fairly well. So uh, yeah, it's nothing really exciting, but it's something that we had to do. And at least we felt good that the data was falling in line with some of the better data that we saw in the literature. Okay. What about uh, magnesium doped alumina? I promise you the grain, 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 grain boundary mobility is going to go down. There's nothing really exciting. Uh, we doped. How much is in there? It's not how much we put in. It's how much we measured. And the mean value is 23 ppm. You'll see that that varies a little bit. But it's well below the 132 ppm solubility limit. This is the grain size of the undoped, uh, the uh, magnesium doped. Um, this is the parabolic difference. And this is the uh, effective grain boundary mobility. So 23 ppm of magnesia does this to the grain boundary mobility. We all know that. That's what you see in the literature. That's what people who make alumina. But now I can say that we're definitely below the solubility limit. And this must be this type of solute drag mechanism. What about calcium? Here we ended up with 13 ppm. 13 ppm. Uh, here's some microstructures. We can see already elongated grains. Uh, that actually is problematic. Because when you look at the gra grain growth data, you see this dip. In, uh, in, in grain size as a function of time. And that is probably the elongated phenomena starting to come into play. And that means a parabolic fit isn't probably correct. And we ignored that and stayed in only this area to extract uh, from the uh, initial sizes. And that's enough to show us that 13 ppm of calcium does this. So the grain, uh, grain growth goes faster. Grain boundaries move faster with only 13 ppm of calcium and again, we're significantly below the solubility limit. Calcium is going to the grain boundaries, and it's making the grain boundaries move faster. That's not solute drag. Compared to magnesium or compared to undoped? Both. 
both. This is undoped, this is magnesium, this is calcium, okay? By the way, it works out that way for the single crystals, the basal plane, the same thing. Uh, uh, this is now colored data showing the single crystal growing into the undoped or the magnesia dope or the calcium dope, and it works out exactly the same. Okay. Um, yeah. Drop off the change point in your data for the calcium. Why? Well, what do you think is causing the elongated growth, and why does that change your fit? And the the um, what's happening here is that a. This is why we did the single crystal experiments. The basal plane is growing, you're getting plates, and these plates are elongated, and this is the basal plane, the flat part of these grains. So it's not that this is growing slower. It's not that the basal plane is growing slower. It actually goes faster because of calcium, but this end is where all the action's really happening. And we were stupid and went and did diffusion bonding experiments of, sa of basal plane to the poly and not one of these prismatic planes. And that's what we have to do now. Something is happening at this end and so that it's really going fast here. Once you get elongated grain growth, abnormal grain growth, then this para parabolic type of fit just doesn't work. So we have to look at the aspect ratio as a function of time and not just the grain size in order to do kinetics. Change point phenomena is due to the mismatch between the growth rates but not anything inherent because of the calcium. It's because of the calcium that not only does it grow faster, becomes anisotropic, and this type of kinetics, this analysis doesn't work uh, when it's anisotropic. So we, we stayed until it rolled over. The rolled over point is when it goes anisotropic. We could, we could have fit it out there. It's just, in my opinion, that it, the numbers would have been incorrect. OK? More recent data. This is not published. Um, this is what I showed you before for calcium. This is Rana Kiva. Ruth Moshe is a PhD student in my group now. And we've gone through and made some more data points. But we did these grain growth experiments in helium in a carbon furnace. Um, everything fits with the calcium concentration, but it, it goes significantly slower in the presence of carbon. Carbon plays a role in alumina. It's just that we rarely see it because we sinter in air most of the time, and there's very little of it. But if you start to sinter in a protective, a protective atmosphere where you can introduce carbon in one form or another, it plays all kinds of interesting roles at the grain boundaries, including reports that it causes strengthening of grain boundaries. And these are some fracture experiments done in Oxford. By the way, here, Frank, is a sample that was not homogeneous. 51 ppm is a solubility limit. We measured a mean value, which is just under that, but the sample was not homogeneous enough. And this data point is real. In other words, it's growing a lot slower because we have precipitation, which is pinning the grain boundaries. OK, nothing really surprising. Uh, but this is the problem that we have when we don't anneal for a long time. So I said that the, grain bound, the calcium is going to the grain boundaries, and it's doing something exciting. But I didn't prove it to you that it's actually there. Um, so here's an experiment where we uh, did the diffusion bonding. Uh, so this is the basal plane sapphire growing into the polycrystal alumina. This particular grain was really big. We went in and did WDS and only measured 10 ppm. So it's a little bit less than the mean, which was 13 ppm, uh, and extracted a specimen and this is just some simple high angle annular dark field stem, nothing really exciting, just to show that the grain boundary plane is more or less flat. And then we did uh, spatial difference analysis in EDS. Uh, this is just a very good statistical method that has no spatial resolution to measure excess at a grain boundary or an interface. So we're rastering the, the beam in stem mode in the grain and in the grain, and then in a box which is at the grain boundary. And if there was a detectable amount, you remove that from what you measure here in the middle. And then you do the full type of a quantitative analysis. And you can see in the raw data the calcium peak that's at the grain boundary, but is not in, in, in the individual grains. So it's definitely going there. How much is there? It, it works out to be 2.6 uh, calcium per nanometer squared, with a detection limit of about 0 0.6 calcium per nanometer squared. So this is the basal plane of alumina. There are about 10 aluminiums per nanometer squared on the basal plane. Uh, 
Let's assume that the calcium is replacing the aluminum for the moment. So this is about a quarter of a monolayer. A quarter of a monolayer of calcium at this basal plane, uh, causing this increase in grain growth. By the way, the, the, to think that it's all in one plane is way, way oversimplistic, and I'm not saying that. So, so solute drag happens in alumina with magnesium, but not, it's not calcium. It's doing something else. It's actually doing two things. It's going there. That's the adsorption that I talked about yesterday. Um, we're not at equilibrium here, but we're, we're, it's going there to reduce the energy as much as it can. In the case of magnesia, the explanation is that the grain boundaries are moving, and uh, this cloud of solute wants to keep up, and that's slowing it down. It's probably keeping up because, of, in the end, energetics, but there's probably a space charge phenomenon as well at the grain boundary. Calcium has got to be doing something else. And the only thing that I can uh, imagine is that it's affecting the mechanism by which the grain boundaries move. And at the moment, the mechanism that uh, I'm assuming is going back to gliter, and that's the motion of disconnections. So the question is, how does calcium affect either the nucleation or the kinetics of the steps that sweep parallel to the grain boundary, not the motion of the grain boundary itself? But that's an open question. The other thing is that calcium is definitely causing something exciting at the other end of these long, elongated grains, because that's where it's really going fast. And that's something that we have to look at. I can't, yes, go ahead. Question, what, I assume calcium is present as Ca2 plus. Yeah, yeah. well, but I yeah. know from some places at GE that they always insisted to do the centric of uh, Lucalux in a hydrogen atmosphere to get a reducing yeah. condition. Yeah. So what does that do to your well, that's, that's a good question. I, I don't have an answer. I think that use of hydrogen is to allow them to use molybdenum furnace. Uh, uh, There's another reason. Nitrogen in air diffuses a lot slower than hydrogen or helium, which is what we use. But I think it, they need, that's the cheapest way for them to get uh, molly of boats and things in the, because they sent to, as far as I know, about 1800, although it's not the temperature. 19. 19 is hotter. Or even 19. It, it, you don't but need. I do think it's to get the trapped gas out of the pores, is the argument I always heard, but I have. Okay. But it would be pretty reducing, which is your point, right? Yeah. Yes. That's what. But not enough that they ever saw precipitates of metal or anything like that there. No. But it might be changing the nature of the boundaries or the surface of the pores. Um, but I also assumed that it was in order to prevent uh, nitrogen from slowing things down. And we repeated those experiments using helium so that we wouldn't blow up a mirror, but uh, that works. I couldn't uh, show the, I can't show this data without comparing it to Harmer's data, uh, Shen Dillon's data, which is really nice data showing uh, grain boundary mobility as a function of temperature. And these different colors, which you can't see, uh, indicate different dopant levels. Uh, they did calcium. They did it at 30 ppm, and they did it at 100 ppm, they did it at 300 ppm. And um, I think that all their experiments were well below 51 ppm. Because if you plot their mobilities, it really does go faster as they have a little bit more, but their absolute values were off, obviously. Um, in almost all their experiments, except for one set, where they clearly had precipitation because everything went, went slower. OK, what about this uh, issue of external fields? So um, I got kind of curious about this because I see people sintering using fields on samples, where they talk about sintering rates, which are really, really fast, excitingly fast, albeit for very small materials. And they call this sometimes SPS. And more recently, there's excitement about flash uh, sintering. And two weeks ago, I spent a week in uh, Tomar, Portugal, where Rishi Raj held a, a week-long conference on flash. Um, SPS is spark plasma sintering, where there is actually still one person who thinks there's a plasma that's formed. Um, I didn't want to look at sintering. It seems to me a little bit complicated. And I wanted to compare it to a grain growth kinetics, not sensoring. So we uh, did, in order to confuse you further, 
prepared this using silicon carbide and not alumina, um, uh, and made dense silicon carbide samples, uh, which were doped with boron and, and, and carbon in the usual way in order to reach full density. By the way, these materials were sintered without pressure, and we got to 94 or 96%. Uh, this batch is 94% uh, at 2100 degrees. We took these samples and we sectioned them. And then we did conventional annealing experiments. And then we did annealing with SPS. I didn't have a flash set up and some friends in the south of uh, Israel had a SPS and were willing to run these annealing experiments. We didn't put pressure. The uh, rams were brought down to reach and make contact. Uh, but the pressure was uh, the minimal that we could do. Okay. Um, there's a problem with SPS in measuring the temperature. Even though they bored a hole and use a pyrometer, uh, the errors can be quite large. And we assumed that we went and looked at the literature. There's some people have done analysis of this, and the worst case was about 300 degrees C. So we did another series of experiments at 1800 in order to compare this. This is the un, uh, conventional annealed. And here you go. Uh, this is the same thing that you saw a minute ago with calcium. Uh, you have elongated grains. This is uh, intrinsic to silicon carbide doped with um, uh, carbon and boron. Um, we can measure the grain size, uh, and we can do this type. Beta or alpha? This is alpha. And we can do this uh, uh, analysis uh, uh, of grain size. And the parabolic fit works. And uh, we extracted a grain boundary mobility of 3.53 times 10 to the minus 17 meters squared per second. That's effective. Just to compare it to the alumina, which I showed you, the undoped alumina was 2.7 times 10 to the minus 15. So this is almost two orders of magnitude slower. But that's, that's our starting point for silicon carbide. So it's a little bit slower, uh, even though we're significantly higher temperatures. But of course, this is a, this is a, a completely different uh, material with bonding, which is very different. Uh, microstructures uh, after uh, no annealing, after a, a eight minutes at 2100 degrees C, only eight minutes. Uh, this is uh, 60 minutes. This is not uh, grains. These are, these are macroscopic crystals already. Um, it goes so fast. This is 16 minutes of SPS versus four hours of conventional, uh, the same length scale, uh, that we're getting poor detachment almost all the time. So, to center this to full density becomes a problem. Uh, and my conclusion when I looked at this data the first time was, wow, this SPS center is really fast. Isn't that lucky? Because otherwise, they would never reach density with this stuff. Um, or they would at least, there's no way to control the grain size. Um, this is 32 minutes, which nobody would do by SPS. But we got curious about the crystal size. And you can even see impingement of small crystals growing into larger crystals. Um, so something is really driving these grain boundaries uh, to move. This is 200 microns, more or less the diameter of our hair. Uh, um, and these are these massive silicon carbide. And this is after uh, 120 minutes. Here, here there's a real problem in extracting uh, mobilities because of the shape. And we started playing with the kinetic models that exist. They're really, really boring. I won't kill you with that. But this is just a linear analysis of the entire population uh, of samples um, of, of grains. This is only the small grains, not the elongated large grains. And we did the same thing with parabolic. And I must admit, we went on and played with this matching of the kinetics. Uh, uh, one can argue what is the right way. And I'll just show you the raw data and compare everything. Uh, 1800, this is 300 deg degrees below. Uh, we also got a. A significant grain growth, but the grain boundary mobility was, was less, more than anne conventional annealing, and that's what this table shows you. So I walk you through this. This is silicon carbide up top. On the far left, conventional annealing, and this is the mobility. 3 times 10 to the minus 17. That's what I showed you before. Uh, this is SPS, three orders of magnitude jump in, a, in a grain boundary mobility. And these are the different fits, you know, um, parabolic or linear, only the small grains, all the grains. Uh, one can argue, but the, it, it doesn't change the, the end result in, is that when you put on this external field, the grain boundaries move uh, extremely fast. Even 1800 degrees C, 
Uh, we're back down to the same order of magnitude, but it's twice the value. Twice the value. Just to compare with the uh, Illumina, I got really excited here when we went from undope 2.7 to calcium dope of 3.5. And here we're jumping three orders of magnitude. Um, this is the aspect ratio. So this is that problem that we started to address partially that we saw with the calcium as a function of a annealing time for SPS. And you can see that it changes. And we measured this very carefully and plotted this out as a function of annealing time for conventional and SPS. And you can see with the uh, SPS, it's really, really large. And conventional, its uh, aspect ratio is, is smaller. And I looked at this, and I didn't understand anything. And I thought, OK, because I'm stupid, and I'm comparing this as a function of time, and we shouldn't be doing that. We should be looking at aspect ratio as a function of grain size. And when you do that, then, of course, the SPS data is, is, down, is, uh, is up here, and the conventional data is down here, but it all fits along one line. But this should also bother us, right? Because this can't be. This has got to ignore the SPS for a moment. One can imagine that we have an aspect ratio which is evolving, but at some point, it's got to taper off. And we've got to reach an equilibrium, not an equilibrium crystal shape, a kinetic crystal shape, and an aspect ratio that should, should more or less asymptotically die off. I think that what's happened here is that with the SPS, we've just gone through that. And hopefully, at some point, which we didn't get to, that would happen up here. That's the only explanation I have for this graph. I'm um, curious to see if you guys have other thoughts. What's going on here? Well, I'm not one of those people that says we have a plasma uh, at the surface of the crystals during sintering, and certainly not at the grain boundaries uh, during the grain growth experiment. But if you look at the, the data I just showed you, and select data because grain growth experiments haven't really been done very much by flash, but there, the influence of the external field does cause an increase in grain uh, boundary mobility. And this has to be associated uh, with the space charge along the grain boundaries. My interpretation is in a way that's very similar to what I showed you with calcium going to grain boundaries and alumina and affecting the kinetics of the mechanism. We're doing the same thing here, but with an external field. But that's as far as I've gotten. That's, that's speculation. I can't prove that to you. Um, but given the, the emerging influence of SPS and flash, uh, then I think that this is something that we need to get a handle on. By the way, someone will no doubt ask, what about the influence of the direction of the field? Because you have an electrode on the top and the bottom, and that's a valid question. So we sectioned these guys in half, uh, perpendicular and parallel, and looked at the aspect ratio and its alignment of the grains to the direction of the field. And there isn't any. So it's not an external field polarity type of effect. It's a specific effect along the grain boundaries themselves. So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end. Uh, I hope I convince you that calcium seg equilibrium segregation of calcium to grain boundaries and alumina uh, is important. It makes the grains go faster, although we really don't know why. Um, and without knowing why, I don't think uh, we can do a lot with this. The same can be said about magnesium, which slows it down. But also there, we really don't know why. And it's time to contrive some model experiments to address this specifically. I think the influence of external fields is uh, equally exciting. Um, all I can tell you now is that this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to set up uh, model experiments that include these types of kinetics, which are kind of boring, uh, with the specific mechanisms. Uh, and we can already say that for sure, step motion is, is, the, is the mechanism. Albeit, we've done this by ex situ much more than in situ, but we've done both. Uh, and there's enough other evidence in the literature to show that disconnections are the, uh, are the culprit. And it's what, what changes with disconnections being emitted but from triple junctions, I think, is what's really exciting here in these mechanisms. Of course, complexions go with this, or adsorption, or BOB, whatever we want to call it. 
But that phenomena, that phenomena is, is going hand in hand. We're changing the chemistry and structure. It's going to affect the way the boundary moves. And that's, that's pretty much trivial. Thank you again. Three lectures. The last one at 80 degrees C. It might surprise you that I have a few questions. Thank, Thank you, you Wayne. Uh, we'll get to these questions in a moment. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> I would like to thank you very much for dragging us, pulling us into this exciting world of research with the air condition assisting you that uh, made us real, really feel like we are in Israel. We've all changed complexion. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, we should not uh, get down to any semantic discussion, I hope. But uh, nevertheless, I want to pass the word to Arthur for the first question. So first, I just want to make a comment. A wonderful set of lectures. Thank you. Um, and the subject of aluminum is a really interesting one for ceramic scientists. It's 60 years ago that Bob Coble at the GRD Center invented, discovered that uh, magnesium additions to aluminum allowed the materials to go to full density. It took another 10 years before General Electric out here in Neela Park commercialized it. And you've all seen these bulbs, these Lucalox bulbs that are in the parking lots and so on. I don't know how many Lucalox bulbs have been made. Many, many, many tens of millions. But there's a, another point that's important. The one millionth Lucalox bulb was presented, not in this room, but in the lecture theater in the White Building, to our very first Van Horn lecture in 1974, a man called Joe Burke, ah. who was Bob Coble's supervisor at uh, GE when the Coble uh, work and patent was done. So it was a great and a lovely um, aspect of this kind of important history. And for those of you who aren't as old as I am, which is everybody, um, <laughs> the subject of what makes what magnesia does to alumina has been a perennial discussion point for at least half a century. It's really a sub the literature, there must be hundreds and hundreds of papers dealing with this. And then I want to tell you why calcium, why a possibility, why you're getting these um, divergent results between magnesia and calcium. Because you've, you've neglected a very important point, which I commend you on your ride home to Israel to read my paper in the March issue of the American <laughs> Ceramics Journal yeah, of the American was... Ceramics Society. <laughs> <laughs> and in the March issue, and I, I'll give anybody who likes a copy of this, I argue that yttrium, which is a different solute, has huge effects on grain boundaries in alumina because it changes the density of states. Why are density of states important? Well, in order for Wayne's grains to grow, you have to have some way to nucleate a disconnection. And that inescapably, in a material as ionic as alumina, will involve electrons or holes. And our community has neglected this since King wrote his book in 1956. And for wide band gap materials, Roger has has provided the van gap of alumina 8 or 9 EV, and it's sort of blinded everybody. Well, we don't have to worry about that. It's Roger's fault. <laughs> <laughs> but the van gap of alumina is not 8 or 9 EV at sintering temperatures. It's more like 5 EV because, they, because grain boundaries will cause a narrowing of the band gap, and there are near band, near band edge states a few hundred milli electron volts into the band gap that facilitate or retard the ionization of impurity of vacancies or interstices which are necessary for your for your uh, disconnection nucleation. Nucleation or movement? Well, we don't really know, but I would guess nucleation. That would be my guess, because uh, once they start moving, then they, they will have a charge but, and I really don't know what the charge is, but I, my intuition is that it's nucleation. I've talked too long, but thank you very much. Thank you for the fourth one on lecture. Let me, let me, I won't answer that, but just say that uh, 
that's probably happening at triple junctions, right? Oh, and uh, those lines are critical as well. And I've ignored those, those triple lines. So do not, we, should, we always assume that because of vacancies, uh, magnesium and calcium and all divalent impurities are the same, and they are demonstrably not the same. Absolutely. Thank you. Peter? <clears throat> so in this split assisted experiment, yeah. you have both calcification and brain growth. What's the effect of fit itself? Is it sort of like an onset or is it linear behavior or is it a maximum fit that you need? Uh, I don't, I don't know. Uh, in SPS, which is a much better experiment than the SPS, uh, sorry, in FLASH, which is a much better experiment, it's a more controlled experiment, there is an onset voltage uh, for magnesia doped alumina uh, uh, in order to s start this FLASH. What do you mean uh, voltage? For voltage you need the specimen thickness to get... And that's exactly what they do. They measure the voltage over a, a specimen, it's a type of a dog bone with electrodes on the end. And uh, uh, with undoped alumina, they could not get it to light up at all. But with the magnesia doped alumina, if I remember correctly, it's something like 300 volts per centimeter. The field strength locally at the brain boundary will be higher, yeah. presumably, because the polar polarizability in the grain boundary will be lower than it is in the... I have to be careful here because I'm, I'm mixing a little apples and oranges a wee bit because these flash experiments were sintering yeah. and not grain growth. Uh, uh, they, diff they haven't explored grain growth using flash and that's one of the things that I'd like to do. Even if, but we, that go, even if we go with the average yeah. field strength, did you estimate whether if you take the energy that is associated with transporting an iron over the width of the grain boundary, just roughly, if that energy is comparable to the sense? migration energy of diffusion at all. Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. It's an estimate. Yeah. I haven't done it. Good point. Pirus had a question for us. Then Gerhard, please. First of all, do dopants in ceramics mean any impurities or only those that change the thermodynamics? Um, yeah, uh, actually, uh, in this case, dopants usually are, people are associated with changes in rates of sintering or grain growth, uh, but obviously, necessarily, these are going to be causing, uh, in these uh, insulators, uh, color centers, uh, changing the, uh, the, the electronic structure, as Arthur mentioned. In semiconductors, at least, uh, very old age, that's going to be the cell diffusion of the silicon and germanium depends very much on the position of this clavicle, which means on the dope. If you do it with enzyme, cell diffusion increases in germanium. If you do uh, it with keta, that means with acceptors, it decreases. In silicon, both of them increase. Now that's for single -less. Obviously, it has more crystal, it needs also brain. So I'm just wondering if these sort of things in the case, because I gave you a and there must be a charge, they can see the charge in the decision. And the position of the camera is extremely I agree with you. Which more is somehow related to that, but it's a different way. And it has to do with the creation of vacancies in the decision. Which are charged because of the family. We change the number of vacancies, the concentration of vacancies, and that changes the diffusion of um, Well, we, yeah, we can. That's one of the basic uh, explanations, not through the Fermi level exactly, but uh, if you look at the defect chemistry of oxides and changing the number of vacancies and the uh, diffusivities of which have been measured, or the electronic properties of, uh, of uh, important oxides. Uh, strontium titanate, ti titanium oxide via control of PO2, that's what you're saying. Um, there's no difference, basically, between um, the activity uh, of a dopant, whether you refer to it, the activity in solution or the activity that's uh, 
or the fugacity of that same, uh, they're equally important. If you look at it from the fugacity or the activity, yes. Can I just make a piece? Uh, you're actually right, the Fermi level is important, but the point, the point that Wayne hasn't emphasized enough, in my opinion, is that lattice diffusion is completely unimportant in aluminum. The, the oxygen and you know, aluminum. It's the fact that. No, no, that but, it's all, but it's all due to grain boundary diffusion. And uh, the mobility, sintering, creep, any property you'd like to think about for alumina is due to grain boundary diffusion. And it's not a point defect mechanism. It is some collective mechanism, which I think is a disconnection. And, but there nevertheless are vacancies or interstitials that have to be involved to allow these disconnections to nucleate and propagate. And there, they affect the band structure, i.e. the Fermi level. So it's the, uh, I, always, I now like to say that alumina is much more sil similar to silicon than sodium chloride. For years and years, we've thought that alumina is like sodium chloride, only more complicated. I don't think that's the case. I think it's more similar to silicon. And semiconductor notions have to be much more important in our understanding of everything in alumina, and including point defects in single crystals. Well, obviously, because it's got a band gap, and so there must be charged vacancy, yeah, charged yeah. interstitial with a Fermi level, and it was a short Fermi level, we'd expect it to be. Absolutely. Because so all those are very important. That's all, all within silicon. In silicon, germanium, silicon. But, germanium, but, silicon, but uh, my silicon. only point is that the alumina community, me included, for half a century, ignored these. And I think we no longer can. Gerhard. Yeah. Uh, I look at it as a from point of view as a composite of alumina with the grain boundaries that have different electrical capacity or electrical field strength. When you apply a voltage, typically what is it for a centimeter mm -hmm. size? Two hundred volts? Uh, for in flash they, they talk about 300, 500 volts per centimeter to start flash. Yeah. Is this DC or AC? That's DC. Does it work with AC? Yes, it does. It, does. it works with AC. Sure. Okay. And is there a measurable current that we can measure from one side to the In the flash experiments, there is. Uh, that's what kills them because the current, when the flash uh, starts and there's a photo emission effect, which uh, Rishi has been measuring, uh, there's a massive uh, spike in the current which they have to control, otherwise it blows out their machinery. So, yeah. And that's uh, for alumina and yttria and zirconia, massive spikes in current that they measure. Can I ask a simple question? Go ahead. Oh, on your flat aspect ratio versus grain size, yeah. when the aspect ratio gets to be large, what do you use for size? Because oh, um, value. here we, we uh, took an effective radius, yeah, an area, effective radius. And I didn't understand your argument for why the aspect ratio can't run away with openness of the specimen size. Well, I, I just assumed that uh, the rates, maybe it's, maybe it's wrong, but I assumed that you would uh, evolve to a, a kinetic crystal shape that uh, uh, would more or less reach steady state. Um, maybe, maybe that's wrong, and uh, if we just keep growing, they'll end up uh, as wires and not just uh, short little grains, elongated grains. Um, we would not have carbon nanotubes if that wasn't possible. Yeah, but that's a little bit different. Uh, do, do you think polytypic transformations may be involved? It could be. And certainly, um, when you do the beta alpha transformation, you get these elongated grains, which are only due to the polymorphic transformation. I don't know that anyone's looked at, say, 4, 4H to 6H or 6H to 9R and all these. We looked, we started uh, to look at these grain boundaries. To be quite honest, I looked first to see if we're talking about any phenomena that we would normally expect that might be there, and we didn't see it. Uh, Intergranular films or other weird things, but uh, uh, we didn't see any type of these transformations. But it, I think maybe we've looked at five or six specimens, that's it. Uh, it's worth looking at. Um, we have been being very careful with that with strontium titanate, uh, simply because of the uh, 
Ruddleston popper phases, which can form along the grain boundaries, perhaps, or playing a role with the formation of these steps. Um, and we haven't seen that. I, 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 that graph worries me. Um, I think it should taper off. It does, it does if, you, uh, if you have abnormal grain growth or, or normal grain growth, it does. When you start to go elongated, alumina, alumina, well, I'll leave it at that. It's a good question. Early in your talk, you said uh, solubility limits do not depend on grain size good. at all. Yeah. But what about down at really small grain size? Because we've been teaching our graduate students for several years now to. The ability to do depend when you get down to small enough grains. Um, let me let me uh, clarify for the students. Um, when I talk about the solubility limit, I'm talking about the amount of uh, doped material in solution inside the grains. The phase diagram that's what's the line of coexistence. The phase diagram describes, and the phase diagram doesn't know about grain boundaries. Mark, you're talking about the Gibbs-Thompson effect. Yeah. Okay. okay, but I'm starting with bulk first. Okay. Um, so, uh, because there are people that say, no, the solubility limit is what you have in solution plus all the excess at the grain boundaries. And of course, that's incorrect. Um, you can try to do a back of an envelope calculation about the amount that's at the grain boundaries versus in solution, even for these types of materials, and it's insignificant. So, um, the, in, in conventional size microstructure, of course the thermodynamics uh, is correct and that there is no influence of grain size on solubility. It doesn't depend on, on the excess, that's what I'm saying. Now, if you have a system that, let's for example assume, imagine the system that there is no segregation, no equilibrium segregation. You have a dopant in solution and it doesn't reduce the grain boundary energy, so it won't go there. And you go down to the length scales that you're talking about, well, then, then we're talking about another thermodynamic parameter, which, of course, can shift the line of coexistence. And so the answer is obviously yes. But there are two different phenomena. And I, I address that because I've had problems of late with people uh, assigning uh, excess at boundaries being part of the solute. And it's, of course, in balance with how much is in solution. But it's not related to the solubility limit. OK, so you're, you're still involved. We're, we're fine. We're, we're copacetic. We, we're saying exactly the same language. We don't have to rewrite the surface chapter in the <laughs> uh, No, but there's some papers that we have to correct because people have been assigning excess as part of solubility, and it's not. Peter. So the <clears throat> accelerated grain growth in alumina, are they going to be linear as symmetric or as plates that you just intersect? They're plates. In this case with the calcium, they're plates. They're not whiskers, they're, they're flat plates. Uh, yeah. What about the, the growth in the various uh, prismatic directions, one of Barbara Noe and one of Barbara Noe, are they about the same? I, I don't really know. Uh, I, think, I think they're about the same. It, it's, it's I haven't the measured them. Okay. So only slow down on the base of it. It's not slow down. I thought it was slow down as, as well uh, with the calcium. It's no. not. In rel relative terms. They grow faster. <laughs> If you look at the undoped versus calcium doped, the basal plane goes faster than in the undoped. It's the other direction, the prismatic direction, the rhombohedral direction, that go even faster. And that misled me in the beginning. Uh, so. Obviously, we could have. I'll ask you question. Please. Uh, I'm not familiar with it, but I have a very stupid. No such thing. <laughs> yes, uh, the magnification of the grain boundary is uh, measured uh, from the experimental data. Uh, yes, how, how, what's the way of, of measuring it? Uh, yes, uh, com uh, by comparing the, the, the picture between uh, the after the annealing. The, the, the grain size or the amount of, of doping at the grain boundary? Oh, what are you asking? The speed. Speed, the grain size? So the speed. So it's a, it, we're measuring, uh, by the way, using a, a nice little program in MATLAB, uh, using the linear inter intercept method, the grain size as a function of annealing temperature. That's it. And, or annealing time. Uh, okay. 
as a magnetization, what's the meaning? Not, a, not into the sliding, just a magnetization. What's the question? It doesn't include grand boundary sliding, which is a migration parallel to the boundary. No, I don't even think that grain boundary sliding exists. Uh, there, I said it. Um, probably piss off a lot of people in this room, but I think uh, grain boundary sliding is probably insignificant. Uh, yeah, but. Uh, but if, if you're just doing, <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> if you're just doing something, I might agree with you, but not on creep. Okay, well, let's talk about the intersections of triple junctions and how that plays a role there sometime. But um, I think that uh, grain boundary sliding is overwritten. It's, uh, but no, this is not sliding. This is just a grain growth experiment. But I think you were asking about the amount. And we measure the amount at the boundary, although we showed this only for calcium here. Okay, So it's an excess of calcium, uh, which is going there to reduce the grain boundary energy. That's the driving force. More student questions? Ask it now. Uh, they've had, a, had me all week. They've had enough. Now I have to travel to Israel to ask it. OK. Uh, we could go on every day like this. But unfortunately, this is the sad point where we have to thank you for three exciting days. And it was certainly a very great pleasure having you here and sharing all these interesting results and stimulating such a lively discussion. So let's give Wayne a big applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.